I just want to briefly make a connection with uh, um, the standard treatment of uh, torque geometry. And sort of, I assume that you have seen how to, what you know, what's a fan and so on. So in torque geometry, one usually has M. Um, the lattice of monomials, N. And uh, so, M is the group of characters. of n copies of gm into c star. Well, if it's intrinsic, it's just an n-dimensional tool. Yes. And n is the dual. And um, we know how to attach a toric variety to a fan. Sigma, the collection of cones in N uh, R. And so I want to make the connection what we did uh, the other time. Uh, so I assume that you sort of know how to do this. A fun is a set of cones, and if sigma is a cone in an R, then you can form X sub sigma. You know, it better be a rational, uh, finely generated rational cone then uh, x sub sigma is a spec of um, the group algebra k sigma dual intersection m. And these, so if sigma, if big sigma now, sorry? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, you're right. Um, for me, k is always yeah, and if sigma is a certain little set of cones, and that need to satisfy some axioms that the intersection of two cones or the closure of two cones is still a cone. There is a bit of an issue whether you work with closed or open cones. Here, you better work with closed cones, I suppose. Let's not go into that. Then, um, then the torque variety x sub capital sigma is a union of affine uh, toric varieties x sub little sigma as sigma runs through all the cones of the fan. That's more or less how you make toric varieties from a fan. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you how to uh, see the same toric variety as a quotient of a a representation of a torus. So the thing to do is the ray map. Which I always call rho. And uh, this thing is constructed so the uh, the set, so, you know, as usual in, the, in this situation, I tend to call rho sub i uh, the image of the ith basis element. And uh, 
So if I look at the set of R plus rho i as you know, i goes from 1 to n, m, then this set is the collection of one-dimensional codes of the fan. So given a fan, you can always form a, a ray map. And uh, in what follows, I assume for simplicity, that the ray map is surjective. Oh, yeah, and uh, not, not only that, but, that, but rho i is uh, primitive, yeah, so that's, that's always understood. <clears throat> so this assumption that rho is surjective is not really necessary, but uh, z being a ring of dimension 1, uh, if rho i is not subjective, then one has to do a little homological algebra, which over z is very easy, but still a bit painful, so let's not do that. I'm not going to tell you what to do when rho is not subjective. <coughs> so then if rho is subjective, then it's subjective, and I can take its kernel, which I call L, and then I can dualize this sequence. So that's Zm star, taking m now. And uh, then the dual is L star. And that's the thing. You know, unfortunately, I did the mistake. In my earlier lectures, all the Ls, all the bold Ls, should have been L stars. But then... Uh, because the kernel of rho is usually called L in the literature, okay? So, you know, maybe you should go back and change all those into L stars. And, oh yeah, because this is the map D. So this here uh, gives uh, X sigma as Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. So you, uh, you could if you wanted to, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, this, this D here, this is the data giving that gives uh, x sigma as a quotient. Okay. So, but what about the stability conditions? Yeah, what about stability conditions? Okay, so let me state now how that works. Um, so notation uh, for a subset I of M, the set one to M. I'm going to define sigma sub I. the cone generated by the rho i's i in i, and this is a cone in n, and I'm going to denote by c sub i 
the cone generated by the di's. I in I, and that's the subcone of L star R. Okay, that's just notation. And the statement for simplicial fans So the fan is simplicial if all its cones, little sigma, are simplicial cones. And that corresponds to the dark variety X sub big sigma being in a natural way an orbifold. <clears throat> the statement is that the cone sigma sub i um, is in the fan if and only if the cone C I complement. So if you like M set minus I, if and only if that cone contains the cone of stability conditions, the ample cone of the torque variety. Well, you know, we just call it the, the, the ample cone of, yeah, well, okay. So, you know, that's it, really. Suppose, and moreover, suppose that you're giving the fan, then uh, the, the cone of stability conditions, the ample chamber, the, the chamber of stability condition, is indeed the intersection over uh, sigma i, you know, over those i's such that sigma i is in the fan of the corresponding cone i complement. And, you know, vice versa, if you're given a stability condition, Uh, a chamber amp, then the fan, sigma, is the collection of all cones sigma sub i complements where uh, A, the ample cone, is contained in C sub i. Okay, so that's it. Uh, C, C. Well, you know, just, just, yeah, C for chamber. Right. So we did comment that the, the, so long as I'm, I'm the inside, in the open part of the chamber, it does not depend which chi I take inside the chamber. So everything. The unstable locus, the stable locus, the quotient, and everything. So somehow, um, You know, I'm a bit ambiguous. Sometimes I just mean the chain. Amp is the cone of stability condition. Amp is the chamber. Yeah? Yeah, it's a chain. Even a chamber. You know, it sort of makes sense to call it that because that chamber will be literally the cone of ample line bundles on that orbit. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is a chamber? Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, given sigma, then, you know, this is a chamber, and uh, no matter who I take inside that chamber, the quotient will come out as x sigma. Okay. That's sort of the statement here. Yes, yes, yes. But then I would have to assume that chi is not on any wall. So, you know, I'm giving a simplified version here. 
for simplicial funds, and you know, those, those toric varieties correspond to taking chi in the interior of a chamber. Then uh, I can recover all other funds by allowing chi to be on a wall. But then the statements become a bit more complicated, and there are some checks and balances, and you know, I don't really want to go there. Besides, you know, well, anyway, that's the thing. So let me make an example. To illustrate all of this, OK? Uh, so I start from the ray map, fan. OK, let's look at this fan. Sigma is this fan here. So let me put in n. I'm just going to draw it. So here n is z2. I put a little cross at the origin. And uh, I'm going to draw the ray map. And I mentioned two for surfaces. The ray map completely determines the fan. And so, you know, this is your fan, if you, if you like. It's the face fan of this pentagon. So let me call those. Uh, so here, the ray map, I can write it like this. So I have five. Uh, yeah, so I'll call these guys row one, row two, row three, row four, and row five. And so the ray map sends Z5 to N, which is Z2 here. And uh, so, you know, row one is the vector one, zero. Row two is the vector zero, one. Row three is the vector minus one, zero. Row four is the vector minus one, minus one. And row five is the vector one, minus one. OK. So that's the matrix for row. And uh, if you work it out, D, the action, you have to take the kernel of rho and uh, then you can write it like this. And so let me sort of copy it. I did it at home. OK, so that's the matrix D. OK, so the columns of D are again D1, D2, D3, D4, and D5. <clears throat> so I want to draw, this is, a, this is a rank three action. I want to draw the secondary fan for this action. These are vectors in R3, D1 of D5. And I'm taking a two-dimensional slice and they generate a cone. And I'm drawing a two-dimensional slice of that cone on the plane of the blackboard. So you see D3, D4, and D5 are the vectors 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. They are the three coordinate vectors in R3. And I'm going to take my slice to be the plane that contains those three vectors. That's the plane of the blackboard. And then those three vectors then appear on this plane like this. That's D3, D4, and D5. OK? Then um, look at the vector D2. D2 is the vector D4 plus D5. So it lives in somewhere in the middle of the, of the line between D4 and D5. So let me put it here. Let's your vector D2, OK? And then I see the vector D1, which is D3 plus D4 minus D5. So it's sort of here. D1, OK? So I'm supposed, so now what are the walls 
of the secondary fan are just all the two-dimensional cone generated by pairs of these vectors. And so let me draw them all. There is this wall, there is this wall, there is this wall, there is that wall. And then from D2, there is this wall, there is this wall, there is that wall. And from D3, there is this wall, this wall, there is this wall, that wall. And then from D4, I think I have them all. Yeah? And so you see now there are some chambers, and these are the walls. And I'm telling you that the chamber that I'm interested in is this one. And so let's illustrate the, the statement there. So what's the fan? The fan is the collection of the following cones. You can see them there. Sigma 1, 2. Sigma. I'm going to make a list of the, of the, of the cones of maximal dimension of the fan sigma. And so that's sigma 1, 2. Sigma 2, 3. Sigma 3, 4, Sigma 4, 5, and Sigma 5, 1. Okay, so these are all the, the cones of maximal dimension of the fan. And then the anticones are the cone C3, 4, 5, C1, uh, 4, 5, C1, 2, 5, C one two three and C uh, two three four. Okay, and so what I'm saying is that this chamber here, the one that I've shaded, is the intersection of all of these cones precisely. So you know, you see, the cone three four five is this big cone here, and it does contain my little chamber. The cone one four five. 1, 4, 5 also contains it. Similarly, the cone 1 what is 1, 2, 5. 1, 2, 5. And you know, all I'm saying is that that chamber is the intersection of all those cones. So, now, you may wonder here now that something is wrong in what I've told you. Because given the ray map, at least here in two dimensions, there is a unique fan that has that ray map. Okay? And so why do we have all these chambers here? There should be just one chamber. Why do we have all these other chambers? What do they do? So the situation with these other chambers is, let me tell you what happens. Uh, it, the, the situation here is very similar to the example we had yesterday, uh, where we had this uh, two, two by four matrix that gave, that had, then there were two chambers. In the secondary fan, one gave the quotient, the, the segregate surface Fn, and the other gave the quotient P11n. And if you remember, the quotient P11n the action was redundant somehow. Of those two C stars, I could have killed one, and then, you know, the quotient in that chamber was actually a lower rank target variety. This is exactly what happens here. All these chambers, uh, these outer chambers, are what we call hollow chambers, and uh, there is one of the actions of these three C stars becomes redundant, and those are target varieties of smaller rank. So they're given by ray fans with fewer rays, okay? And so let me not go into that. You can, you can, you can explore it on your own if you want. But that's the only important chamber that, that you, that, that, that's really um, doing something there. Okay. So, okay, so I stop here, and I let Al take over. Where is Al? <laughs> Good. I was fearing you'd. Uh... Is this okay? You're, you're, you're happy to yeah. take over?
Ah, non mi succede. Don't worry about the rest. Okay. Okay, so maybe you remember in the dim and distant past, we introduced the idea of mutation. And this was you took a polytope and you impose the grading on your lattice and you slice the polytope up and then you sort of applied um, sort of, I don't know, socialist principles to it. You take from those that have and you give to those that haven't. Okay? So I just want to start by doing another example of mutation. Okay, so I'm going to take the following. So let's Take the cone over the hexagon in three dimensions. Here's my hexagon. Okay. And then below the hexagon, I'm going to put the origin. And then below the origin, I'm going to put the next vertex. So let me just label these. And here is the origin. And down here, minus x. And then this should just join up. So what I want to do is I want to investigate um, a couple of mutations of this. So I'm going to take this top facet of the polytope, and I'm going to try and mutate it in two different ways. So the hexagon um, has two different Minkowski factorizations. Okay, so the first one, well, I'll just redraw the hexagon. I'm afraid this is going to be taught with lots of drawings of pictures, but that's okay. Okay, so I can decompose it as a pair of triangles. Or I can decompose it as free line segments. Okay. So this is going to give us two different mutations that we can do. So we have two two possible mutations of P. And so the first one, I'm going to just use this triangle decomposition. So if you remember, we describe a mutation by giving ourselves a primitive vector in the dual lattice, so the grading, which in this case is going to be 0, 0, minus 1. And then we award ourselves our factor that we're going to choose, and our factor is going to be at height zero with respect to the grading. Okay. And um, 
start this up there. I'm just going to write it as a two-dimensional shape with the origin there. Okay, but this is really meant to be living at height zero with respect to this gradient. And here, I remove a copy of that factor, and then down here, I stick in a copy of that factor. So, of course, when I remove a copy of this factor, I'm just left with this. So, at the top, on that top facet, I'm going to have my triangle left over. I'll label these straight away. And then the origin is around here. And then down at the bottom, I've now added in my factor. So it's going to look something like this. And taking the convex hole, it just joins up like this. What's happening at the back? There's a like that. With all of these things, it's so much better if you draw them yourself than copy someone's blackboard drawing. But here's the origin. stare at this, you'll see actually there's a change of basis that makes this a lot more understandable. Um, to be honest, I don't know what the change of basis is, but I did stare at this and see this. So we're going to get a square at height zero and then just E3 and minus E3. We're going to end up with this. origin sitting there. Just going to be E3 minus E3, E1, E2, um, minus E2, minus E1. And remember, we're working in N, so if you want to turn this into a toric variety, you need to take the spanning fan. And if we do that, well, we have these rays. Like this, and maybe you recognize this. This is just P1 cross P1 cross P1. So I'm going to just name this, for reasons of my own, Q3. And what we have here is um, XQ3 is just P1 cross P1 cross P1. Okay, so we should do the second one now. So for the second one, I'm going to do a mutation that removes one of these line segments from upstairs and moves it downstairs. And so when I remove a line segment from the hexagon, I'm left with a square. So we see what we get. So it's going to be exactly the same grading, of course. And this time, well, you know, this is even more sloppy than we draw in the triangle, but I'm choosing a line segment. What happens at the top? Like I say, we end up with a square. Let me just label these. Okay. And then the origin is maybe here, 
and then this is the point at the bottom, and we've added in this line segment that's going to come to here somewhere. Okay, and then when we take the convex hull of this, it's going to look a bit like this. This one's even more weird than that one. And just stare at it for a bit, and hopefully you'll spot that it's not actually as bad as it might seem. Um, now, he says that. Yeah, so here, 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 and here, although it's a bit hard to see in this picture, we've got a square just like we've got this square here. And so if you get this right, what you end up with is this. So let me try and draw it again. So I'm going to give myself the square, and then the origin here. So this is a plane with the origin. Suspended above it is going to be E3, and now um, there's going to be a facet down here with the other point here. So let me just join all this up. I'm going to end up with... I just label these, um, I guess, the same labeling. So um, E1, E2, um, minus E1, minus E2, 0, E3. Then this point here is going to be minus E1, minus E2, minus E3. Okay. So this is the square face that was at the top. And then, I guess, this is the line segment that we moved downstairs. And so you're going to ask me, what is this toric variety? And, um, you know, I don't really know, if I'm going to be honest. Um, but you can write down the, um, the weights without too much difficulty. So in this case, D is, well, let me label my vertices in some order. So maybe I'll label them, um, oh, okay, it doesn't really matter, does it? Row one, row two, row three, row four, row five, row six. So here we're going to have D1, D2, D3. D4, 5, and D6. And what linear relations are there between these? We have um, well, we've got row 1 and row 3 is a linear relation. We've got row four and row two. And then finally, we've got row six, row five, and then row three and row four. So row six, row five, row three, and row four. Yeah. So you know, this is, for what it's worth, this is the weight matrix but it's toric variety. Okay. So let me just draw the fan in. So the fan looks like that. This, 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 and then down now. Good. Okay, so there's two different mutations that we can do out of this polytope. And if you remember, the polytopes were really in our minds, just being Newton polytopes for Laurent polynomials, okay? And I guess the important observation is 
I put that top facet. It's impossible for a Laurent polynomial to factorize in two different ways. It can do one or the other, but it can't do both. So, I guess the, um, the main point is that um, if F is a Laurent, Um, such that the polar top of F is P, then um, F can follow at most one of these mutations. It can do both of them. Um, so let's just write down two Laurent polynomials that will do these two different mutations. So we'll just write FA to be a generic Laurent polynomial. I'm going to put I'm going to put coefficient one at every single one of these vertices, and then I'm just going to put a, a variable a in the middle of that top. Okay, so. We just have z of x plus y plus y over x plus 1 over x plus 1 over y plus x over y plus a plus 1 over z. Okay. Then um, f3, this is the one that admits the triangle mutation. So just a little bit of tidying up, it's z over xy, and then it's x plus xy plus y times by 1, well, the factor, 1 plus x plus y plus 1 over z. Okay. And if we go away and, um, yeah, it's getting a bit long. If we go away and we calculate its period sequence, just successive powers of the constant term, remember. Then we get something that begins 1 plus 6t squared plus 90t to the 4 plus dot, dot, dot. Okay. Remember, Alessio sort of made this analogy at the beginning where we're kind of developing the yellow pages of Fano manifolds, okay? And we've got little bits of our telephone directory sorted out, and you can go away, you can look this person up in our yellow pages, and you'll find that this is a mirror for um, P1 cross P1 cross P1. And that's to be expected completely, because, of course, when we did the mutation, we ended up with P1 cross P1 cross P1. So you'd hope that that's what we'd find. Okay. So what about the second case? The case where we mutate the line segment and leave ourselves with a little square at the top. Well, it's just as easy. So we have F2 in this case is equal to Z over XY. Um, 1 plus x, 1 plus y, x plus y, plus 1 over z. Okay, so this allows the second mutation. And here you can go away and you can calculate the period sequence. And, um, well, we don't expect the same thing because we kind of don't expect this to also be a mirror for p1 cross p1. And indeed, we don't get the same thing. So we get 1 plus 4t squared plus 60t to the 4 plus dot, dot, dot. Okay. And again, you can go away and you can look up this telephone number in the other pages, and you can find out what final manifold this is a mirror for. I'm not going to tell you just yet, because kind of part of the point of what we want to tell you is how you can figure this out from the polytope yourself, okay? But anyway, this also turns out to 
be a mirror for a final manifold. But not, it can't be, P1 cross P1 cross P1. I guess what's going on here is um, the toric variety XP has um, two deformation components. Okay, and particular choices you make of the um, Minkowski factors, basically pick which of those components you're allowed to live on. I suppose not really mutation factors, it's the whole mutation data. So mutation data. Um, picks which factor, which component. Yeah. But this mutation data, you know, it's very subtle. Um, I don't think we really understand what we're talking about anyway at the moment, but. Uh, it does seem to be that you have to award yourself more than just the polytope. You have to award yourself also this additional way that you're going to allow your polytope to, um, to be mutated. All right. All right. So very quickly, just to sort of finish off. If you remember in toric geometry, there's two lattices that take a big, play a big role. There's N, where the fan lives, and then there's M, the dual lattice, where minus K lives, where the divisor stuff lives. So mutation has got a rather beautiful, whoopsie daisy. Mutation has got a rather beautiful expression in the dual lattice M, which should satisfy Don, because it doesn't have those remainders in it anymore. Let me show you. So let's let P be a polytope, okay? And the dual polytope, just in case you've never seen it before, is just defined to be all those points in the dual lattice um, that evaluate to at least minus one on P. Okay, so this is the dual. And in toric geometry, this is the minus k polytope. And so we have that the volume of p joule is just equal to the degree. And um, the number of points in successive dilations of p joule It's just H naught of minus MK. So we ask, if I mutate P, is there some way of seeing how I can change P dual without just having to mutate P, then dualize what I get? And the answer is yes. So we can um, see how mutation acts on M. Okay. Um, I'm certainly not going to prove it, but the sort of key observation is that if I take any lattice point U in M, okay, then there exists some um, integer M Yeah. 
such that 1 over mu is a supporting hyperplane of P. So once you've made that observation, what you can do is you can sort of look. So here's my P, maybe. Here's my 1 over M, U. So I can look locally at P at that point, and I can just figure out how P changes under mutation. And this lets me see how this hyperplane changes under mutation. OK, so um, we can um, see how this changes. When we mutate P. Okay. What do I? Okay, that's true. Okay, so if you want, I can write. Exactly. So I can just write H U 1 over M, by which I mean the set of all those points in N such that u n is equal to 1 over n. Okay. Is what equal to minus 1, sorry? No, it's the, it's, okay. Yeah. No, it's, it's not even that. So this, it's the set of all those points, um, a and n, such that u of a is equal to 1 over m. I'm just taking. <laughs> 1 over m u. That's true. You're exactly right. It should be, it should be that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, okay. All right, let me say it this way. Let me rub that out and let me say this. Such that um, U is a member of the boundary of MP dual. Okay. Jews. So what we have is um, mutation defines a lattice automorphism phi. Okay. And it's basically given by piecewise linear function. So it's um, H times the min of U A for a in the vertices so come back to the point that Don raised last time you know in the definition of n side mutation there's um, a lot to dislike about it okay it's not really a map it's as just a process. You take your polytope and you slice it up and you do some stuff and then you put it back together. Okay. And it involves these little remainder terms that are there basically to make sure that you can do this. And you know, it doesn't really matter what remainders you choose, so you'd think it would be nice to remove them from the definition and all that sort of stuff. And here we have this really nice um, description. It's only involving my factor A and my H. There's none of this remainder junk. It is just a piecewise linear map. You know, and you say, why didn't I just use this? And I suppose for some purposes, that's really useful. Of course, we're thinking about Laurent polynomials, so it is more natural for us to think of what's going on in N. And there's another issue, too. I don't know if anyone actually knows the answer to this. Um, of course, I can just take any P dual. I can take any H and any A. I can apply this to it, and I can end up with a new um, object. Right? And maybe throw away the cases where it's not convex, but you know, I can end up with a new convex object. And when I dualize back, is it still a lattice polytope? 
Does it still stand any chance of being the Newton polytope of anything? And I don't know how you can tell that just from the data that you have in M without doing the whole dualization process and so on. So all the hard work is done in the end side definition, basically to ensure that when we apply this, we still end up with a convex lattice polytope in N. So this, um, I'll just say, this acts linearly um, in each of the chambers um, given by the inner normal fan. Defined by A. Okay, it's nice, it's explicit, it's really concrete. So, for example, without making this, you know, a true example, let's just suppose A is equal to some triangle, okay? And this is inside H per. Okay. Then we want to draw what this chamber decomposition looks like in M. All right. So I'm going to rather cheekily draw my triangle in M, where it doesn't belong, because it does lie in N. And I'm going to figure out what its inner normals are. So, of course, the normal vectors would go like that, that, and that. So I just need to take the negation of them. So I'm going to end up with a... Of decomposition that looks something like uh, this. And again, maybe you know, I think it's perfectly fair for some people to get a bit upset that I said that this was a fan and these aren't strongly convex cones. They all have at least one, a one dimensional vector space in them given by. H. So here at the middle, here, oh, I thought it was a different color. Okay. This is the um, linear space spanned by H. Okay. And then within each of these chambers, so let's just call it, let's just call this one. Sigma A, this chamber here, well, it corresponds to this vertex A, okay? So the chambers, um, sigma A, are just in bijective correspondence with A in the vertices of um, A, and in each one, you know, I, I, mean, I don't need to do this. It just looks like this. And so this is a shear transformation. Okay, sorry, but I just mean it moves in the direction of the vector h in each, each chain. I don't want to overrun, so we'll stop. And um, next time I'll give some examples. All right, cheers.